alaikum. Um, so uh, there's something important here to mention. Uh, so I, I am basically a, a professor of Quranic studies. Uh, so and um, my main interest actually during the, the seminar that I've given and now here is to show you an example how we contemplate, how we think about the Quran and what, some of the basic principles, how to do this and mainly how to do moral reasoning uh, of it. So one of the issues that I've noticed, um, um, we project, I mean, mainly for Muslims and even non-Muslims, uh, we project some of our beliefs, ideas, concepts on the Quran when we read it. This is normal, of course, but when we try to understand the Quran deeply and to do like some kind of uh, 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 deep analysis uh, of it, we should try to put these ideas back, to hang on these ideas and to rethink and to, uh, to, uh, to put ourselves in the place of the first hearer, of the first audience of the Quran. So when I read this verse, I should think of myself as an Arab in Mecca, a pagan Arab in Mecca, and this verse, uh, this surah is addressing me. So what is she saying to me exactly, to my worldview, to my ideas? This is the, one of the basic principles in order to understand uh, the Quran. So uh, let's complete a little bit, uh, go on with, the, with our analysis. So uh, we talked that as an Arab, the virtue of generosity was very important. And that's why we have Al-Karam, it's related with karama, I mean generosity, the translation of karam is related with dignity. So both like very uh, much related. While the Quran later on, not in this uh, uh, early phase, uh, proposed a completely new concept for this, which is zakah, which has to do with purifying, with, with uh, uh, um, um, uh, purifying the, the self uh, and also Ziyad, like, um, um, I would say, um, developing the moral uh, conscience of the human being. Tazkiyatun nafs, it's related with, with uh, uh, um, uh, training the self. So, Does this surah, one of the uh, uh, um, points that you've mentioned, it's free will. With free will, some of you mentioned Alam uh, wa So, uh, um, where is it? Uh, yeah, point out to, to him the two clear uh, um, ways. But some others saw some different thing, right? So, yeah. You you did. Can you just tell us uh, your? Um, I am a psychologist, and the first thing I always, you know, um, look at, uh, think uh, when I look at a, a scripture, the behaviors and the feelings that I'm having, right? So because they are really linked in a very strong way, and when I look at these questions, like. Does he think that no one will have power over him? Um, does he think that no one observes him, right? I feel in a very strong way that I am, you know, under observation, and this makes me annoyed. I, I feel, I feel like I am a puppet. Uh, can you understand that? <laughs> like I have no free will. You know, I am here. You know, I was created for a reason. But on the other hand, I feel like I have no power because 
there is God and he has the power on me. So uh, what's the point that I am here, right? If I can't control my behaviors, I... Yeah, thank you. So uh, how, how would you respond to this? Do you think that this surah uh, like instigates such a feeling or such understanding? Uh, when I look at the first part without knowing the background or okay. the history at all, just mm -hmm. by looking at the mm -hmm. scripture mm -hmm. and just by reading that one. So, uh, uh, does he think that no one will have power over him? Mm -hmm. uh, I think also it goes back to the point that you initially um, suggested when you just began that second session that we do impart um, much of our understanding to, to our own subjective experience and feelings. So I think if we were to approach the text and take, take such a fatalistic, you know, or have such a fatalistic sentiment to this verse, it could be owing to maybe our own understanding or our own faith levels possibly. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of having... So on overview our actions, whether it be on a regular day-to-day -day basis or on, you know, um, more generally with God overlooking our actions, it's pretty acceptable. But I suppose coming from that, already that God-centric worldview, mm -hmm. maybe it doesn't induce the same feeling that it may on others who take issue with having a higher authority, have power over their lives and their decision-making. Yeah, but does, uh, what does power he means, actually? Maybe control of our actions? Okay, maybe. Um, I don't know. I was wondering if it's contradictory, the aspect of power and free will. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was thinking of if he refers or if he uh, puts power equivalent to the human consciousness, like the human consciousness as an embodiment of God's will or God's generosity. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Well, look. There's some also some of the principles of like dealing with the Quran. Now we are we are dealing with translation because we are not sure that all of you knows Arabic, uh, <coughs> and this is a problem. We cannot explain the Quran uh, through uh, foreign language. There will be always uh, misunderstandings, and this is basic. So, in order to do like a proper uh, study of the Quran, you need to, to know Arabic very well. <coughs> so, of course, for Bawar, this is not in the Quran. The, the, the nowadays understanding of power is maybe, as, as uh, uh, our colleague here said, it's intimidating. It's OK, I have something uh, authoritative over me. He's controlling me and stuff like this. But this is not in the Quran. And mainly, uh, uh, I, I, I would say, as, as, as you've said, it's talking about the concept of responsibility. So you are responsible for something over you. So you were created for purpose, for trial and trial, and he has power in the sense that you are responsible for him. And here comes the moral concept of responsibility. responsibility. So you are not, like, without, uh, not in this life without any aim. And in order to understand this, now me as an Arab before Islam, well, I was always saying, uh, we live and die. And there is nothing else than the, the, the time. The time is going on. It's in, in, in uh, linear time. We are living in linear time. We, uh, we are born, we die, that's it. There is nothing. There is no power over us. There is no responsibility. This is the moral worldview of the Arabs before the uh, Islam, before the Quran. But the Quran saying, no, this is not the case. You were created for a purpose, and you have responsibility for your deeds. 
Well, the Arab will say, well, I'm doing well. Um, I've squandered great wealth. I'm helping a lot of people. So the Quran will say, uh, and also the, uh, the Quran will try to, to, to uh, clear up this issue. But before this, he will talk about what also some of you have mentioned. Like, okay, if I am responsible, do I have the qualities needed for taking moral decisions or not? So, how is the answer, the answer of the Quran for this? Um, maybe I can just uh, respond to, to your um, question or the contradiction between um, uh, observation and free will. Um, I think that's the answer, or the answer of your question will answer this question. Uh, uh, it's about if I'm responsible for something, Allah uh, is saying that he has given us the equipment to be responsible for our deeds, for our believings, like um, eyes, tongue, lips. In, in, in other sources, in other verses, he's uh, speaking about uh, about tadabbur, uh, tafakkur. So we have like the equipment to to distinguish between right and wrong, the path. And um, I think the the point is that we have to justify for it. So responsibility, it's not just um, like endless um, responsibility ends in justification to justify for um, the deeds uh, in the akhirah. And because of this, God is speaking um, with terms of observation. So you are responsible for it and someone is watching that. And it's written and there will be like um, witness for what you have done in that life. So for me, there is no contradiction between these terms. Um, what's the percentage of free will that I have, right? And what's the percentage of uh, the controlling of God? I I'm confused about this. Mm -hmm. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I have free will, but what's the percentage? Yani? Okay, we'll see. Yeah, yeah thank you. So, Sorry, did we add not... Something? Hmm? Can what? I add something yep. to it? Um, I think you're taking it in a negative way. So when it, when God is saying about power, it's more of a guidance. So in order to live your life in this world, you need a guidance. Like uh, take example of washing machine or any white goods. You always get white goods with a manual. You wouldn't know how to operate it. If you won't read the instruction in the manuals, you will be all, all over the place and perhaps, you know, mess up with the um, goods. So it's not about controlling um, or having someone power over you. You need someone to guide you, like your parents. So uh, take it that way. Um, I think you're using very harsh words here when you say you don't have a free will. Yes, you do have a free will, but then when you make decisions, without having a conscious concept of uh, someone who guides you, then you bear the consequences. And then it can be negative yeah. and positive. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Th uh, th thank you. I mean, we have limited time. We will continue discussing, uh, discussing but uh, uh, let's be more uh, concrete. So also one of the uh, ideas, we, I have said we shouldn't project our like uh, let's say, Islamic uh, later on developed worldview on the Quran and also philosophical concepts. The language of the Quran, as you see, is figurative, <coughs> symbolic. I mean, these questions that I'm putting here responsibly, it's not there, but I can infer it from the Quran about the tools to reach a moral judgment. It's stated in figurative language. So, did we not have? Uh, did we not give him eyes, a tongue, lips? So, it's it's just saying you have the the the, the tools in order to uh, uh, to make moral judgments, and and point out to him two clear ways. So we know what's good, what's bad. Of course, how to understand this? There are theories, but 
This is one way of reading the surah, is to say we have the ability to take moral decisions. And, of course, we are responsible. <coughs> Nonetheless, there is something more now. So what we understand from yet has not attempted the steep path. How do you understand this in relation to our moral judgments or moral actions? Why this is important? That it's not always needed to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. What else? And it's about position, to make the position of the person. Mm -hmm. What else? Yeah. Maybe the journey from unbelief to belief. Um, where to find this? Um, because he does go on to explain that, you know, to be a slave, to feed a hungry person, etc., and to be one of those who believe. So it's mm -hmm. the Yeah, thank you. Great. Any other? Yeah. In a sense of? In a sense of how people are behaving. Because as you also mentioned, it is not for the Muslims. So it's for everyone, yeah. It's for everyone. So it's, for me, it's more about the personality development of an individual, how he is going to utilize his or her resources or the blessings of whatever the path is, using the akal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So, steep path here. As you've said, morality, moral decisions are not an easy thing. You have effort. You know, the concept, the moral, the philosophical concept of uh, that has to do with moral, uh, the moral effort. I mean, morality doesn't happen without an effort. You need an effort that is uh, uh, reflects that morality. So, just to give to 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 uh, uh, enhance your your uh, social status, your nobility is not something um, of value for the Quran. The steep path, as explained later, is to free a slave, to feed uh, hunger, uh, uh, an orphan relative, and so on and so forth. So, morality is something. Uh, that demands an effort, a great effort, actually. And of course, this is all in an urban sp uh, space in city, where you have, of course, also this idea of responsibility is also uh, expressed in the beginning, figuratively, uh, by parents and of uh, offsprings. So. Normal, uh, usually as Muslims, when you read the Quran, we read this just as kind of swear, qasam, and go on. But we don't think about this. What is the relation between this qasam, swear by parents and offspring, and the whole surah? It's all about responsibility between parents and offspring. This is all reflection. It's our relation with God is with God here we, I mean, for like secular, we say it's not God. Maybe it's just the moral uh, ideal, the moral like uh, uh, higher uh, uh, um, uh, uh, entity, whatever. So it's this kind of relation of relation that's based on responsibility, on a effort in moral effort. Uh, yeah. So this is how uh, a sort of a kind of moral reasoning that we are doing uh, uh, in this uh, class. Uh, yeah, do you have questions related to this? Yeah. Can we also add to that? So, um, it seems like the verse starts off um, with more a communal outlook. So mm -hmm. basically you are an inhabitant of this city. And then also he sort of concludes with that where he says that and to be one of you know, those who believe and urge one another to steadfastness, steadfastness and compassion. So here morality is not necessarily individual, individualistic, but does have that sort of communal aspect of it. So he begins off with that and then he sort of concludes with that. And he didn't use any sort of taqib or anything of that nature, but rather 
there's a sense of and, and, and. So an accompaniment or ma'iyya. Mm -hmm. So one mm -hmm. goes with the other, mm -hmm. goes with the other, and they cannot be divorced from one another. So mm -hmm. I think that yeah, also th is encompassed. Th thank you very much. This is a great point. I missed that one. I mean, this is a great point because this also, uh, when we look at the pre-Islamic worldview, it's totally individualistic. Totally individualistic. Now the Quran from the early beginning, you are inhabitant in, in, uh, of the city. He's talking about this communal uh, uh, aspect in the beginning and the end. Thank you very much. Any other comments or questions? But just one thing I was uh, thinking when I was reading um, the Arabic text again and again, um, when he is describing the the reactions of the of the rich persons who live in Mecca, saying I have squandered great wealth, it's uh, he's speaking in the past. So after they have done done it, they're coming and boosting and saying I have done this and this for for this uh, for the reasons you have mentioned. But when he is talking about the, as we as we have spoken, Islamization of, of, of virtues, uh, he's speaking about doing, not about speaking. So we are freeing slaves, feeding um, hungry people, uh, the orphaned relatives. So it's more about acting, about doing, not about um, speaking and telling. That's, mm -hmm. that's one aspect. And the other aspect I was thinking about is um, that the, 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 the moral way isn't, isn't an easy way, as we have uh, explained. Uh, maybe there's um, a strong connection to the very beginning of the surah when it said, we have created man for toil and trial. So, um, so there is like an um, indication that, um, that uh, like a moral life, a life uh, regarding to, to, uh, to the revelation isn't, isn't such easy. Uh, than the other one who is just talking and saying, I've done this and this one. Mm -hmm. So just <coughs> these two ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, please. <clears throat> I also wanted to mention maybe there are different terms like power, control, guidance, like depending on um, whom we are addressing. Of course, the Quran is addressing all humankind. But the question is like um, the reason why it is not spelled out so clearly um, is because of the contextualization, as you've mentioned with this Sora, um, but also with the relationships, so that every human being individually can recognize him or herself in these sentences um, um, that have been transmitted. So maybe um, this, this is an important aspect to keep mm -hmm. into mind, the relational aspect and the contextual aspect. Thank you. OK. Uh, so this is one example. Let's move on to uh, like um, so. How to 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 understand the 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 moral theory of the Quran? There are several approaches to do this. Uh, I will talk just uh, briefly about two approaches. Uh, I will begin with the one of uh, Toshuhiko Izotsu, which is saying that in order to understand the moral theory of the Quran, we should concentrate on the concept, of, on the moral concepts of the Quran and analyze them in contrast with the, mainly with the pre-Arabic, uh, pre-Islamic uh, uh, Arabic virtues and analyze them in the context. I will talk about the method later. So this is one way of understanding the moral um, theory of the Quran. The other approach is to undertake a philosophical uh, analysis on the whole uh, Quranic corpus in order to extract the basic moral principles to answer all the philosophical uh, questions related to ethics. And that approach was mainly undertaken by uh, Muhammad Abdullah Daraz, Daraz. So for Izotso, uh, according to him, he sees that uh, analysis of the language of a specific text is the main 
uh, source of understanding its moral worldview. So, th the moral worldview of the Quran is understood or is going to be understood through its moral concepts. When we analyze these moral concepts and compare it with, the, with uh, earlier and later understandings, we understand, we get a, a, a clear idea about what's the moral theory of the Quran. And of course, he, he says that the various concepts compromising the Quranic worldview don't stand in isolation from one another. So we cannot t take just one uh, uh, concept. We should understand this concept in what he calls a semantic field, or we should gather all the moral concepts and organize them into semantic fields these semantic fields have relations between these concepts, sometimes contrasting relations, sometimes parallel relations, uh, and understanding. We should understand each concept in its relation to other concepts in its specific semantic field and in uh, relation with other fields. So, semantic analysis of the Quran can be carried out in uh, synchronic and diachronic fashion. So, we can just say, well, I will undertake a, a, a synchronic uh, 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 way, uh, sort of analysis, which is, I don't look at the history, I just want to have the Quran between my hands and try to understand the Quran as, as, as a corpus, as some regardless of the historical development of the Quran itself or of the uh, <coughs> history before or after the Quran. Diachronic uh, analysis means that we should understand the Quran in its historical development throughout uh, 20, 23 years of the uh, 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 Prophet's uh, 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 mission and later on throughout the history. And we can, of course, combine both these uh, 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 sort of uh, analysis. And of course, according to Izod, so understanding the moral worldview of pre-Islamic Arabs is essential for understanding the moral system of the Quran. Uh, yeah, so this is the, 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 uh, the approach of, of uh, Izod. So, uh, and it's useful, but nonetheless, it in many times it cannot like give us uh, a, a, a clear answers about some of the uh, um, urging uh, philosophical questions that has to do with morality. That's why, for example, Muhammad Abdul Adraz said we should try to extract the philosophical principles that uh, uh, stay behind the Quranic uh, discourse. But before moving uh, from uh, Izotso, uh, do you have questions about his, his methodology or approach? Or have anyone of you read his book? Yeah, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, he, he, he was actually before them. I mean, he, he started his, there was a, an aerial version with a different uh, term in early uh, 50s, actually. And he depended mostly on uh, like German uh, linguists, like uh, somebody called Weiss, uh, those who are talking about uh, like language as a, a catalyst of, of culture, so in simple. So the culture, if you, if you want to understand the culture of, of a specific nation, you should understand their language. This is the main 
like the basic idea behind this. Any other? Uh, okay, so let's move to, to Dra's uh, uh, approach. So, <coughs> the first approach is kind of virtue ethics. Now we have philosophical meta-ethical uh, approach to the Quran, which asking, for example, the, the ontological question. What's the nature of the ethical value concepts like good or bad? This is not a new question. This were uh, uh, raised from the early centuries of Islam, and there were different theories in answering this. So we have, for example, the Mu'tazili uh, party, who answered this by saying, well, uh, good and bad has, have an objective meaning. They are ontologically there, right? What's this? So an example for this in the Quran, إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي. God commands justice, beneficence, and giving relatives, and he forbids shameful and uh, blameworthy acts and insolence. Do you see the relation between the answer and this verse? Why do we say this verse is an indication that ethical values have objective meaning? Because there's no definition. They seem to be clear. Mm -hmm. Any other? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's sort of taken for granted that we know what exactly is meant by justice and Islam and the different religions. It seems like it's an objective reality that anyone yes. can understand. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So one of the arguments for this is saying, look, the Quran is saying, do this, justice, beneficence, ihsan, and so on. But he is not explaining actually what adl, what justice is as if we understand this. And this is a clear indication that ethical values has, have, have uh, objective meaning. Another party, like uh, Ahl al-Hadith and, and, and most Ash'aris, or early, some uh, early uh, Ash'aris will say, well, uh, right and wrong, has no, have no uh, objective meaning. It's equal, actually just what God decides. God decides what's bad and what's good, and that's it. They don't have like objective uh, presence. And they quote this uh, verse as an example. Okay, uh, it's not fitting for a believing man or a woman when a matter has been decided by God and his messenger to have any choice about their decision, and whoever disobeys, uh, disobeys God and his messenger, he surely strays off a magnificent straying. Uh, وما كان لمؤمن ولا مؤمنة إذا قضى الله ورسوله أمرا أن يكون لهم الخيارة من أمرهم. Uh, so, do you see the relation? Any objections or confirmation of this argument? I mean, that this verse is an indication for subjective understanding of the ethical values? Yes. So, Muslims from the early centuries of Islam we're struggling with these verses. And some of them will call this mutashabihat. 
so sort of like conflicting verses of the Quran. Some is is uh, uh, supporting objective understanding of the values. Others supporting subjective understanding of them, or what we call voluntarist understanding of them. And that's why we have a genre from the early centuries which is called mutashabih al-Qur'an, so a kind of ambiguity uh, uh, or an exegesis of the ambiguity verses in the Qur'an. And yeah, the whole kalam is, is uh, I mean, kalam literature is about to, to resolve this issue. I will not resolve it right now. So another example, uh, whatsoever the messenger gives you, take it, and whatsoever he forbids, abstain from it. Fear God, for God is strict in punishment. So this is another uh, yeah, uh, verse for this uh, uh, opinion. And yeah, so this is a question about ontology. There's another question about uh, epistemology. Okay, if we said that the ethical values have objective or subjective uh, uh, um, uh, meaning, can we at all reach this objective understanding of the values or not? In a sense, do we need revelation in order to understand the moral law? Or we don't need it? So also from early centuries, for example, Mu'tazilis, uh, at least some of them, defended very harshly that the human being is able to reach the objective meaning of the ethical values. So we can understand what's good and what's bad without revelation. We don't need it in the beginning. And some of them will, uh, have said, we will be also like uh, judged according to these objective principles in the hereafter, even before Islam. Because everyone knows that killing is bad. So those who committed uh, 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 murder before Islam will be punished in the hereafter. They are not like, they will not be freed as the other innocent people uh, were living at that time. Many other scholars said there are like nuances and differences. I'm just trying to, to give a, a, a sim, kind of simplistic picture. Uh, most Ash'aris and other schools will say, well, yes, m we may understand, but we need revelation. The revelation is the, like, the clear cut way of understanding the, uh, even the objective meaning of, of uh, uh, ethical values. And for those who were like, radical uh, subjectivist, subjectivists uh, uh, who said, well, good or, or bad has to do only with the, with the uh, will of God, and that's why we need revelation. Without revelation, we cannot know what God wants from us. Uh, yeah, and there's uh, an interesting, uh, uh, like, uh, an, uh, an article written by uh, George Horani in his book, uh, Reason and Tradition uh, in Islamic Ethics. You can read more about this, the details of these, uh, all these arguments and its different nuances and, and uh, arguments. Uh, so, questions? Objections? Sir? So is the yeah. argument about, uh, I mean, about uh, objectivism and subjectivism, yet any benefit? Is there any benefit in, in the argument at last? Argument, uh, the argument on either good and just uh, or any uh, ethic behavior 
uh, is objectivism or subjectivism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand your question. So you are saying that, uh, what the hell are we doing? Is it important at all to discuss this issue? We have revelation and yeah, full stop, right? So the issue is, uh, no, this is uh, uh, um, yeah, an important question. Yeah, just to mention, Kevin Reinhardt uh, has also written a book important about um, uh, before revelation. Before revelation, he talks about these discussions also. Uh, yeah, but the issue is, we have a lot of issues right now, and in every time, that we don't find clear laws or clear uh, stipulations in the Quran or Sunnah uh, for uh, deciding about them, like bioethics, right? And if somebody who's very like radical subjectivist will say, well, I cannot do anything about this, I should wait for a, a revelation from God. Almost nobody says this. Uh, but uh, others will say, no, we have like a system of uh, understanding that we can extract like sort of principles from the Quran and Sunnah in order to solve such issues, right? But this means that we are, uh, we are capable of doing this. We have the capacity to do this. And yeah, uh, and this means also that uh, good and bad has uh, have have um, an objective uh, uh, substance, right? So it's it's uh, it's very important. It's very important. Yeah, yeah. Please, please. Because he mentioned bioethics, so <laughs> yeah, uh, to say something about that. Uh, I think uh, um, uh, the the. Um, the debate, because I also teach this in my introductory course on Islamic ethics, this issue of su subjectivism and objectivism. <coughs> if you choose objectivism, uh, absolute objectivism, I mean, so that we can realize the inherent quality of acts through non-revelation sources, let's say. Yeah? So our epistemology is rationalism and our ontology is objectivism. The act has in itself, by itself, a moral quality. I, as a subject, I don't change that. And I um, can discover this through my own human intellect or whatever, science or any other reason. This is something. And to say that God decides and we need to know what God decides so that we can act is a completely different thing. <laughs> so, for, for instance, the fuqaha, they talk the uh, position that it is God who decides. So all the time you are looking for knowing the will of God. This is what you are trying to do. Not your own will. And by the way, also not the will of the Mufti. So I'm asking a Mufti not to tell me what he thinks about something good or bad. This is not the point. I'm going to the Mufti to tell me, because he has more experience, I, am not, I, I cannot do it myself. I don't have the expertise. It's such a complicated issue. So I ask him to tell me what God wants me to do, to do not what the Mufti wants me to do. So he is just a helper, informant, someone who, who, who is going to do me. You are doing this because you think that things are good and bad because God decides that they are good and bad. So I'm following him. He's the one who created me. He, he's the one who created the world. He know how this complex network works. And he's the one who will give the reward and punishment in the hereafter. So I cannot go beyond his own will. And I mean here, by the way, the legislative will. He said, do these things, don't do these things. Sometimes he's so clear about what's needed. You pray five times a day, you fast one month in the year, etc. And sometimes you have to use your mind and intellectual capacities 
as intensively as possible to know his well. And this is the main problem of many of the modern thinkers uh, who think that the position of um, voluntarism and traditionalism, uh, those who think that it's God who decides and, and, and it's tradition who tells you that this overrules the role of human intellect. All the time you need human intellect to know the divine well. The, I always say to my students, the Quran is not a telephone book. You are not going to read the Quran, for instance, euthanasia. If you read the Quran as a telephone book, you will never have an answer. You cannot look at an index, where is euthanasia so that I know what God wants me to do. It doesn't work like this. The Quran gives you a framework, and then you have to use hum human intellect to know the divine well. So you are using your human intellect all the way, whatever position you take. But you are using your human intellect to judge, or you are using your human intellect to know the divine well. This is the main part. And this makes a world of difference. You get the point? I hope I could. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's move on to another example from Hadith. Uh, yeah, please, very fast. Okay. Like the nature of something is good or bad. Yes. But since God created everything, mm. God knows whether it's like good or bad because it's created like this. Nothing would exist mm. if God hadn't created it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So God mm -hmm. has already decided the nature. I don't know if it's clear to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think I uh, thank you. This is an interesting point. So the issue is some uh, uh, some scholars uh, tried tries this to solve the issue, saying, "Well, uh, the, the the values are objective in nature. Something is in in nature good or bad, but this nature were created by God. So yeah. So at the end it will be the same. Yeah, at the end it will be the same, but." In general, <coughs> nonetheless, they they still objective, right? According to this, yeah, uh, yeah. I think this is the Maturidi position, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, 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 exactly. Possibly yeah. this is the Maturidi position, okay. if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, you're because right. Because they yeah. took a middle path between the extreme Ashari and the extreme Mu'tazili in this regard. Yeah, so God um, orders what's good, not just because he just wants this, like arbitrarily. No, because it's good in its nature, as he previously. Yes created it. So this, this last sentence is a methodity sentence. Yes, As exactly. <laughs> so yes. so it's not like he's uh, uh, obliged by something more than him. Yeah. This is one of the issues in Kalam. It's just because he كتب على نفسه الرحمة. So he, he, he obliged he him. On himself to be merciful. Yeah, to be merciful. It doesn't mean that he is like less powerful as, as, as he should be. It's just a, 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 a figure of speech to say there's a, an objective value of mercy which he already created and he is committed to that value.
Yeah, this is the, the other issue, the epistemology, yes, yeah. So in epistemology, most, I mean, the majority of Muslims will say, well, even if we said that ethical values has, has, has uh, like objective uh, uh, presence, nonetheless, we are with all our like uh, social and historical context and our like uh, uh, feelings and our, uh, uh, how to say, uh, um, uh, uh, whims and stuff that can, uh, these all these issues can prevent us from understanding the right, uh, the moral law, the right moral law, and that's why we need revelation in order to clear uh, things uh, up. So uh, we have uh, 10 minutes. Let's uh, look at hadith and how uh, hadith. I mean, Sunnah deals with the issue of uh, ethics. So we have this famous hadith uh, of the Prophet. I was sent to perfect the honorable morals. Right? So the implication of this hadith that there were a moral system before Islam. The Prophet came in order to perfect that moral system, not to like uh, abrogate, cancel that, uh, and substitute that moral uh, system, but to perfect that moral system, to repair that uh, moral uh, system. So, just one example. There are many versions and, and connections, but just to see how uh, morality uh, uh, plays in the uh, Sunnah. We have this hadith. أكمل المؤمنين إيمانا أحسنهم خلقا وخياركم خياركم لنسائهم. The believers who show the most perfect faith are those who have the best morals, and the best of you are those who are the best to their wives. Uh, we have several hadiths which is relates between like حسن الخلق being morally perfect and specific virtues like being generous, being merciful, and here in this case, uh, being good to, uh, to wives or to women, actually. Uh, we cannot say that Nisa'ahim here means wives. Yeah, sorry, this translation is not exact. But yeah, to be nice or to be good to, to women in general. Uh, so, This is one case, right? Uh, now we will read another hadith. So this, this uh, sort of hadith is kind of like setting the rule of morality is very important in religion. And it shows specific cases. Now we will have a, a like a case which is a bit strange. And we have many other examples, similar examples of this. And this hadith, I will, who wants to read the, the English and to help me with this? Nobody, okay. Uh, the Prophet said, don't beat the female servants of Allah. La tadribu ima Allah. Then Umar came to the Prophet and said, O Messenger of Allah, the women have become emboldened towards their husbands. So issue an order to beat them. And they were beaten. Then many women went around to the family of Muhammad. The next day, the Prophet said, last night 70 women came to the family of Muhammad, each woman complaining about her husband. Those are not the best of you. We have this hadith. Now, how can we understand this hadith? What do we need to understand this hadith? Well, as in the Quran, we cannot understand this hadith regardless of its historical context. And just to, to, put, uh, to make it sh short, the long story short, we have 
conflict of two societies, the Meccan society and the Medinan society. I mean, by society here, I, a sort of like a, 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 a moral system, two conflicting moral systems. In other hadith, we need to read other hadith to, endure, to, to understand this, not from this. I'm just trying to clear this. This hadith yeah. is in, I think, At-Tirmidhi. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think it also contains in Bukhari and Muslim. It's a very famous one. Yeah, but not this version. This version, I think, it's from At-Tirmidhi. And he said it's Hassan and Sahih. So the, the historical context of this is that the, the Meccan society were used uh, or was used to, I mean, Beating the woman there was a kind of normal thing, a custom. Nobody or no woman will like uh, 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 protest against this. It was normal. Husbands were hitting, beating their wives unquestionably. The society in Medina was not, even from before the Islam, this was not a custom there. Women were not used to be beaten in Al Medina. When the Prophet moved to Medina, he said that hadith, لا تضربوا إماء الله. Don't beat the female servants of Allah. Of course, here we have time, space of time. After some time, Umar came to the Prophet and said, and Umar is Meccan, he said, our women, we are not used to this, this kind of generosity. If we if we didn't beat them, they will not uh, uh, obey us. Please issue an order to do that. Yeah, what we understand from this that the Prophet said, okay, do it. And then they, they have done it. But nonetheless, the Prophet came at the end and said, after this problem, the, uh, the woman, after the complaint uh, of the women, the Prophet said, those are not the best of you. I mean, those who, who beat their women are not the best of you. So now, what's the moral rule here? Can we, are we allowed to beat women? Are we not allowed to do that? How can we understand this? What's your opinion? Of course, in relation to with the previous hadith, which has to do with, which puts a clear, like, relation between morality and being good to women. Um, sorry, Dr. Samir, can I? So the question here is that, um, does Islam permit sexual assault or physical assault, um, I meant to say, um, uh, just a minute. Let me just uh, try to refine your. So we are talking about. We are not talking about Islam right now, right? We okay. are talking about this specific general text. concept. Yeah, we are now okay. analyzing specific text. We don't make to make now general uh, 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 general statements. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. To be. So my uh, my question is more of a basic um, of a general. Um, nature that um, are we meant to pursue a sense of you know physical assault when it comes to you know treating women so. uh, no the question right now is we is have moral? we is have ethical? we have like a general statement relation <coughs> clear cut relation between morality and being good to women right this is the first hadith now we have hadith which is the prophet said don't beat and then he said, okay, you can. And then at the end said, those who are doing this are bad guys. How do we understand this? Yeah, please. Um, just to speak from an educational perspective, so it's my perspective, uh, I think we have that issue not only in um, uh, with this topic of beat or not beat, it's, it's uh, a topic like, um, with, with other issues also that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are educating the people. And it's a, pr it's a process, so it's a development. Um, 
uh, as you have mentioned, the, the, the society in Mecca uh, was a society where w women do not have any rights. Beating was normal. To have many women were normal in that time. Uh, to, uh, that woman has to obey her husband was a normal thing. So Islam comes uh, step by step to, um, to set a new standard for uh, how a man and woman has to deal with each other. So um, for me, when I'm reading this hadith, uh, I do not recognize a problem with that. Uh, when I see it with educational eyes or from educational perspective, he's saying it's forbidden, you, should do, you, uh, you shouldn't do that. And after you have doing that, uh, he, he comes and he's blaming that to say, okay, you are not from the, you are not the good guys, as to say from the best guys. And when we are considering uh, the hadith before, when he's saying, khayrukum, uh, khayrukum li ahli, for example, um, so he's just step by step setting a new standard how um, man has to um, handle like problems in their marriage. And it, it's a process we, which needs time. We have strong um, Sahabis like Omar, who is getting angry and has his temperament, as we know from his biography, and other Sahabis. So a uh, Prophet is, um, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is trying to educate them, so not to come and forbid it and say, okay, from now it is haram, maybe they will not accept it, it will, it will be um, difficult to maintain it. Uh, it it's, it's a kind of process, so I can understand the hadith. Thank you. Yeah, please. And you after that, yeah. Uh, sorry, in this hadith, I don't see a particular indication to the um, legal value of beating women. So it doesn't clearly state there it's haram or halal, for example, or it's anywhere in between. It, if anything, it refers to the gray area in between. Um, and it also points to uh, relativity but sorry, but in moral character. Don't beat. <laughs> don't beat the female servants of Allah. It's an amr. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah. But then um, towards the end when he says that, he says they are not the best of you. So it, it only just really points to, morally speaking, a gradation of, you know, there are the best and then those are the ways that are a little bit weaker. Mm -hmm. So you're somewhere in between. It mm -hmm. doesn't really point to the fact that you have transgressed or mm -hmm. this was an act that was specifically prohibited. Mm -hmm. If anything, his, mm -hmm. his mm -hmm. statement doesn't emphasize his earlier statement of, you know, do not hit. For bringing this up, because this uh, uh, refers us to the issue that we find in Usul al Fiqh, and also Muhammad Abdullah Daraz discusses in his book that the moral obligation, as as uh, as a philosophical concept in uh, in Islam, in Quran and and Sunnah, has degrees, and uh, in these degrees, uh, yeah, you, we can differentiate between like different valuation of our deeds. And maybe this is one of them. Uh, we'll come back to this. Please go ahead. OK, um, I think um, what she was saying is actually the line I was, I'm also thinking um, about it's problematic when um, we talk about it in a binary way, whether it is haram or accepted. Because from the hadith, the prophet started by do not beat them. And then after that, he said, OK, go on. Then he said, but you are not the best of them. So um, we all know about the, um, the idea of akhlaq al-hamsa, where you have what is permissible, what is um, recommended, obligatory, reprehensible, and then forbidden. So I think it is something that will fall in one of these, but not just the binary way it is where obligatory or it is forbidden. So it has to fit in one of the three in the middle. Um, so it is not something that we can just point out that it's allowed or it's not allowed. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, so this goes back to this issue that in virtues, virtues have uh, degrees. For example, I, I will just give a short example because we're run of time. Uh, Al-Qisas, retaliation in case of murder. Is, is it a moral value or not? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, I mean, for most uh, human beings, it's, uh, it's justice. 
It's an, 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 an clear example of justice that you should re retaliate from the one who commit murder. Nonetheless, the Quran accept this uh, uh, right, this value, but he said, وَأَنْتَعْفُوا أَقْرَبُ taqwa." So forgiveness is actually better than retaliation. <coughs> so we have degrees of values, and this is one of the important issues in the Quran and Sunnah. And in the case of murder, forgiveness is higher ethical value, moral value than uh, retaliation, although retaliation is justice. Uh, so this is uh, one case where you have like conflicting uh, understanding of the uh, uh, moral law. And of course, some will say, well, maybe there's like details that we have to consider. So this is not clear cut. We should go into details and see why the prophet like uh, uh, um, how to say condemned their uh, beating their wives because they were not following the the right way of of dealing with their wives. So some some of my students said the Quran like put uh, uh, like uh, several ways in order to to solve the. Uh, the family issues and this beating of, uh, of wife is just the last thing and in very extreme cases and they were like very fast they just uh, uh, hit their wives and this is, was against the Quran and so on and so on and so forth so there are a lot of uh, 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 discussions about these uh, issues and this is just one examples you will find this in, in, in many other uh, cases uh, very fast but uh, referring to your point, I don't see any any legitimization of violence in this quote uh, that we have here. Because first he gives the rule that you don't have to uh, beat your wife. And then at the end of this sentence, um, he is calling the person out that he didn't do something good or right, righteous thing. And also in the middle of the sentence, it is written that uh, they were beaten. It is not written that he's, the prophet said that they should beat, but that the human himself decided to beat. So I don't see a Yeah. Can I? Uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's a long issue. I, I know this from experience. This is a long issue. I, I just wanted to uh, give you an example of a uh, uh, complicated issue. Uh, this is the biography, some of the uh, like uh, interesting stuff about this uh, issue. Uh, so the first book, uh, Hadi Shamma, uh, has written book. I think this is difficult to find the ethical system underlying the Quran. Uh, Maryam al uh, has written a book about Islamic ethics. Uh, ethics. Uh, and this mainly about the Kalami discussions, theological discussions of mainly Mu'tazili and Ash'ari uh, uh, schools. Michael Cook uh, has written an interesting book about forbidding wrong uh, in Islam, and of course the definition of wrong and, and, and right and stuff. You will find a lot of stuff there. Of course, Muhammad uh, Abdullah Draz is a key book in this. You have two other books which talks about the issues of uh, ethics in Islam, ethical theories in Islam of uh, Majid Fakhri and George Hurani, and then the main, uh, the key book of the Izotso. Uh, Dawood Rahbar uh, also has written an interesting book about uh, God of justice, the concept of justice in the Quran, and the discussions between Mu'tazili and Ashari about this uh, concept. And uh, yeah, Fadl Rahman is also one of the major uh, authors in this uh, field. And yeah, Kevin Reinhardt talked about this issue about the moral judgment before revelation. Uh, any general questions or comments? Uh, yeah. In uh, what, what do you mean, get? Uh, we, can, we will yeah, talk with yeah, the uh, yeah, colleagues. That yeah. they, can, they have your emails, I suppose. Yes. Yeah, that's possible. I think. <coughs> yeah. Should be okay. yeah, that should be okay. Yeah, so listen. In this slide is about morals or ethics and women. In Islam, is there, um, does ethics differ based on gender? Is there a specific gender ethics in Islam? Uh, 
uh, I don't know how to answer. Uh, what do you mean exactly by this? Because yeah, when you ask such a general question, I need to go into details and uh, understand what is this. Well, so what's good or bad is good for and bad for man and woman. There's no difference. But, I mean, in, in, when we are talking about virtues, about uh, conduct, there are some deeds which is good for man, but not good for woman and vice versa. Uh, that's all I can see, uh, say right now, but this is a complicated issue. Well, uh, <coughs> I don't know. It's 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 it, uh, after lunch. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I I don't. I mean, in the Quran, at least when I read the Quran, I don't find an example of this. But I'm talking about tradition. You will find in tradition such uh, examples. So, uh, like to go in war. This is for a man, a, something good, but it's not obligatory for women and also not something that's much good, right? This is just one, yeah, <laughs> example. Yeah, please. Uh, this will be tomorrow. Tomorrow you, you will have enough uh, time to discuss this issue. There will be a specific yeah, lecture for this. Okay, thank you very much.